Learning about our past isn't just interesting, it's important in helping us shape the future. Our city's 150th anniversary, or sesquicentennial, is an opportunity to celebrate the pride and vision of our founder, General William Jackson Palmer, along with so many other people and events contributing to our progress and growth. This UCCS lecture series illuminates the role the university has played in our community's history and how it will continue to shape Cairo Springs for generations to come. Thank you, Mayor Southers. All of us at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs are honored to be part of this year-long celebration of the 150th anniversary of Colorado Springs. As we celebrate this milestone in the history of Colorado Springs, I'm grateful to have been part of the Colorado Springs community for almost 30 years. I watched Colorado Springs grow, and I've had the pleasure of watching UCCS grow right along with it. There is a sense of community created by our shared history, and that is what makes every community different. Our history is what makes Colorado Springs unique. This lecture series will highlight the role that UCCS has played in shaping our community during the past 56 years, and how our UCCS faculty, staff, students, and alumni will continue to shape Colorado Springs for the next 150 years. Thank you, Mayor Southers and Chancellor Reddy for that fantastic introduction. My name is Jennifer Ferda, and I am the Director of Partnerships, Government, and Military Affairs at UCCS. Thank you so much for spending part of your Saturday with us. This afternoon's presentation titled Exploring Our Urban Forests, presented in partnership with the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, is the third part of the UCCS mini lecture series celebrating Colorado Springs sesquicentennial. Say that five times fast. Right now, I would like to introduce Meg Poole from the Pioneer Museum for a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much to Jen and to UCCS for being a wonderful partner for our April Scholar Series. We are thrilled to have you join us for this special program today. Um, I wanted to take a moment to thank our generous sponsor for this month's lecture, Pikes Peak Heritage Series, which is a program of El Pomar Foundation. The series works to preserve, protect, and promote the natural assets of the Pikes Peak region. So thank you so much for supporting this fabulous program that I know we are all looking forward to today. I wanted to briefly mention this program is a part of the museum's year-long scholar series. We offer lectures every single month throughout the year, and we are part of this larger citywide commemoration of the sesquicentennial. We're excited for next month. We have a program called the Past, Present, and Future of Rodeo. It's a panel discussion, so put that on your calendar. It's Saturday, May 8th at 2 p.m., and that will also be a virtual program. I also want to make sure to mention our brand new exhibit. If you haven't come to see it yet, please visit us. It's called COS at 150. Our staff worked to put together an exhibit of 150 objects that tell 150 stories over the past 150 years. We are free and open to the public Tuesdays through Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. We do ask that you hop online and make a reservation in advance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meg. And I have seen that 150th exhibit and it is absolutely fantastic. I highly encourage it. Uh, in just a few moments, we will be enjoying our keynote presentation from Dennis Will and Dr. Christine Bierman. Before we begin, the pro begin that program though, I have some Zoom webinar housekeeping tips to share. Uh, you should see two buttons at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's a chat and a Q&A. Following the formal presentation, there will be a question and answer session with Dennis and Dr. Bierman. Please either utilize the Q&A button throughout today's program to submit your questions for the panel. Please note that we may not have a chance to answer all of your submitted questions, but we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible in the time allotted. If you would also like to just ask your question or make a comment, you can do that to the entire group during the program. Please use, utilize the chat button and select all panelists plus attendees drop down before you share your comment. We would love to see conversations flowing in the chat. And if you by chance happen to have any technical issues, please also use the chat button, select all panelists and into your query and somebody will help you out. 
Uh, that's enough for our Zoom housekeeping right now. Let's get on with the program. I would now like to introduce our first presenter, Dennis Will, a graduate from Austin State University in Texas in Bachelor of Science in Forest Management. Shortly after graduation, Dennis moved to Colorado and began his 15 year career with the Colorado State Forest Service in Woodland Park. His responsibilities were private lands, forest restoration practices, insect and disease diagnostics, and manager of the district's seedling tree and reforestation program. In March of 2005, Dennis began his urban forest career with the city of Colorado Springs, where he is our city forester. He is in charge of care and maintenance of 300,000 publicly owned street and park trees, 15,000 acres of forested open space and 250 miles of right-of-ways. In his spare time, he enjoys woodworking, using repurposed lumber, photography, and hiking our 14ers. Welcome, Dennis. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this morning when I woke up, I thought I'd work in my shop for a little bit before I came to work to do the presentation. And when I rolled the doors up, I noticed what a beautiful day it was and people were riding their bikes by my house and walking and hiking and running their dogs and all those kinds of things that we enjoy here in Colorado uh, on a summer Saturday day like today. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that there's gotta be a million different ways for people to enjoy themselves on a Saturday. And yet here you all are for this presentation. And so I just wanted to say I'm humbled by your attendance and I appreciate your time today. So uh, Mr. Mannix, let's get started with the first slide. If you think about the uh, hard sciences, most of those are hundreds if not thousands of years. And I'm speaking of say astronomy, mathematics, engineering, hydrology, even maybe chemistry. But the science of forestry really didn't evolve until about the late 1700s and the first School of Forestry became uh, in existence in 1898, uh, I beg your pardon, in 1778 in Europe, in Austria and Germany. And the first school was established at Gießen in Darmstadt, Germany. But it was another hundred years before it caught on in the United States. And the first School of Forestry was built in this uh, abandoned farm building by Carl Schenk, who was also a German forester. He came to the United States in 1895 and became the staff forester for the 125,000 acre management of the forest on the Biltmore Estate. He replaced Gifford Pinchot. And if you recall who ben Gifford Pinchot is, he was the very first US Forest Service director and he started that job in 1898. Now, uh, there are some converging storylines here. I wanna leave that in your mind for a moment. And if you think about what was going on in Colorado at mid-continent away, in 1872, J. Sterling Morgan convinced the Nebraska State Board of Agriculture to recognize a day for planting trees and he called it Arbor Day. And that began, begat the Arbor Day Foundation and the Tree City USA certification of which we belong. At about the same time in 1871, General William Jackson Palmer established the city of Colorado Springs and he did some kind of cool stuff with trees and we'll get, get to that in a moment. Uh, but I wanted to tell you that those two gentlemen were friends. J. Sterling Morgan also started the International Society of Arboriculture and he held uh, that position of president until he passed away in 1902. And then Mr. Palmer took over upon Sterling Morgan's death and he held the position of president of ISA until his death in 1909. Next slide, please. So this is a very early image, obviously, of what the city of Colorado Springs looked like. It was practically devoid of trees, although there are a few there now, the street, this city, and this image is barely a year old. And I'd like to draw your attention to the tree on the far right hand edge and then those in the back. And so even though the, the city was only a year old, they were already starting to plant trees uh, 
and starting to see some survival. Uh, uh, this is a fascinating image to me because I often think, what were those guys thinking? What were the surveyors thinking when they drove the first stake into the ground and said, here, we're gonna start right here. We're gonna start a community on this with windswept plains. We're gonna build houses. We're gonna build a community and we're gonna plant trees. And then the other thought of it that, uh, that occurs to me when I look at this image is when they first started building homes there, how cold and windy and dusty it might've been and how difficult it might have been to bring people to the new community when there was literally nothing there to support them once they got there. Next slide, please. So we fast forward about uh, 15 years. This is uh, Tejon. Looks like my image is, is partially blocked on my screen here by the, um, the attendance. Anyway, so about in 1872, there was already a canal system brought down from Fountain Creek through the western side of town to water the new cottonwoods along the streets. And you can see the canals at the base of the trees on both sides of the street. You kind of see the checkerboard pattern there. And the very first year in 1872 that that canal was ready to go, uh, 600 cottonwoods were delivered from the San Luis Valley and then another 5,000 the year after that. So it didn't take long for Palmer and his group to begin to build houses and to plant trees that help mitigate the harsh weather and the environment with which they chose to live in. Next slide, please. So this to me is the iconic image of what the city of Colorado Springs looked like without any trees. And yet there was a building that popped up literally in an in this treeless void, even though it's 1880, that's nine years after the city was started. And you can kind of see some trees going left to right about mid image of that, that screen there. So that's probably the cottonwoods that were planted at the beginning of 71 and 72. And uh, one of the things I'd like to also point out is if you look in the distance at the slopes of Pikes Peak, that there's quite a paucity of trees there. In 1852, there was a very large fire that occurred that began around Fort Carson, went up U Pass all the way to Hoosier uh, Pass and also to Wilkerson Pass. A gigantic fire, one of the very largest in the uh, history of Colorado that the Native American Indians called the Big Burn. And so the, the image that you could see now, if you were to look out your window and see the same side slopes, you'll be able to tell how heavily reforested the uh, foothills of the Pikes Peak Massif had become with trees from that 1852 fire. Next slide, please. And this is an image I believe that is facing north that's called the Reich Rock off into the distance, Cascade Avenue on the far left, and then you can see a row of trees on the far right, that's Tejon. But when I look at this image, when I first saw it, uh, as a forester and as an arborist and as a woodworker, I thought, my God, where's all this wood uh, material coming from to build barns and outhouses and houses and railroad ties and mining timbers. And so there was a tremendous amount of logging and forestry activity that was going on in this time period. And that lumber was coming from the foothills of Pikes Peak and also from Black Forest and beyond. At one time uh, in the Kiowa area east of town, there were literally 20 sawmills and over time, Black Forest was just all but clear cut to build the new community of the city of Colorado Springs. Next slide, please. So this is Tejon looking north. There's Acacia Park on the right hand side. These are the cottonwoods that were planted in the early 1870s. And uh, here it is barely 15 years later and those trees are probably about 30 feet tall. And so I was visiting with Jeff Cooper, one of our staff foresters earlier about this image about how good the trees look despite being young and had freshly been planted. Uh, he and I came to the conclusion is that there are very little hard surfaces like there are now, the asphalt, curb and gutter, uh, the, the homes and such that would have impacted the environment that these young trees were growing in. And so the soil was not heavily compacted. All of the water that fell on 
to the side in the form of snowfall or rainfall was going right through the tree, uh, through the streets and into the root systems. And therefore he had very vigorous growth. And uh, I would imagine that that was quite heartening to the people who may have lived there from the very beginning of the city and to see the trees grow as fast as they were. Next slide, please. And then here it is in 1932, you can see homes in the background, large trees growing over this part. This is Monument Valley Park. And uh, oddly enough, a couple of weeks ago, I received a phone call uh, to find out if this tree that had been planted by the Colorado Mountain Club was still there. And we actually did look. We thought we might be able to find that using the homes in their background as a reference, uh, but we never did find that tree. Um, but uh, you can see that uh, by the mid 1930s, trees are growing quite well, the community is growing, and people are taking care of their urban environment. Uh, the, thing, the other thing that strikes me about this image too, though, is, is when you think about the Cutler Hall image when there was nothing there and see images of normal activities in parks that have large trees in the background, you have to think that is a lot of tree planting. But the other thing that strikes me is Almost every tree that was planted there in some fashion is a non-native invasive tree that really did not belong there. And so what we're asking our trees to do in this harsh environment at high altitude, high semi-arid desert is to grow where they normally wouldn't want to grow. Mr. Maddox, next slide, please. So back to our converging story with Mr. Jackson, uh, William Jackson Palmer. He started the community in 1871, became the second president of the International Society of Boriculture, and he held that position until he passed away in 1909. And this is a significant uh, thing to bring forward because, next slide, what he did before he passed away is he started the city forestry and help write the code and establish the code that created City Forestry in the city of Colorado Springs. That happened in 1910. So even though the position was created in 1910, that position wasn't filled until 1911. And uh, if you had time to read that document, you would see that the first city forester that came on in 1911 was paid every other week to the tune of $12,000 or $1,200 in 1911. So that comes to about $33,000 a year in our, our wages or about $15.86 an hour. So he wasn't making a lot of money, but he was the very first forester and that was pretty cool. So the next slide, please. So this is him. This is Mr. Fred McCown, the first city forester and the reason I thought it was important that I go back and talk about the establishment of schools of forestry in Europe and then in the United States was that uh, General Palmer also stipulated that the first city forester and those thereafter had to have a scientific background in schools of forestry. It couldn't just be somebody off the street. They had to have scientific knowledge of how trees grow, how they're propagated, the species selection that might be needed in our harsh environment. And apparently Mr. McCown held that kind of background. And I did for a while try to poke around and try to fi uh, figure out which school he might have gone to, uh, but it was unsuccessful. And by the time he got hired in 1911, there was about a dozen schools of forestry, mostly on the Eastern continent uh, of the United States. So there's no telling which one that he went to. His first uh, annual report noticed that there was 1,229 trees of a mixed bag of species, species, mostly silver maple, American elm, green ash, box elders, those kinds of things. And since then, since Fred was hired, there's been 10 city foresters, and uh, I am very proud to be the 10th one in all of that 150 years. So if you haven't noticed, uh, Fred McCown held his position for 47 years. Fascinating when I found that out. Next slide, please. So this is uh, Platte Avenue in 1918. And uh, what I would like to do right now is I want to uh, give you an example of how things come full circle. If you were are politically aware, you know that on Tuesday, 
a ballot measure passed that would allow the city to have a, a larger format of discussion of how thing, the code and the city would operate uh, in the ballot measure. And that passed on Tuesday. And uh, the, the effort, I believe the long-term effort would be to add a new parks uh, funding apparatus in the November election that's coming up. And so I found this fascinating. I want to read you this. This is from A City Beautiful Dream, the 1912 vision for Colorado Springs written by Charles Mulford Robinson. He was a city architect. And this is one year after Fred McCallum was hired. Quote, it must be clear, however, that in Colorado Springs above most places, park improvements and recreative facilities have a direct commercial value. Because of this, a bond issue to make possible the improvements that would give to the city a park system as first class from the point of view of service as it now is from that of scenery would seem an especially good investment. It is also plainly in the city's interest to grant to the park commission for maintenance expenses as large a proportion of the annual tax levy as can possibly be spared. Quote, unquote. And so I found that fascinating because they were already saying in 1912 uh, uh, that they needed more money to maintenance the parks and the streets and the street trees, just like we've been saying 150 years later. I thought that was pretty cool to find that. Next slide, please. So that kind of brings us to today. Uh, this is what city forestry looks like now. This is what it looked like when I inherited the city forester's job in uh, 2018. And so we're basically broken into administration and operation side and our right of way. So we have two staff foresters, myself who manage the street trees and the forested open spaces. And we have several hourlies that assist us. We're hoping to uh, have three more sign on here in the next couple of weeks. And then we have about nine certified arborists who uh, conduct the actual work on the ground planting trees, removing trees, pruning, spraying uh, for insects and diseases, grinding mulch, things of that nature. And then we have two gentlemen who work in our right-of-way department who are in charge of mowing the weed control in the right-of-ways and contract mowing oversight. So we're not a very large group. Uh, we're spread pretty thin. We have difficulty keeping up at times with what we're asked to do. And unfortunately, our, our uh, group is mostly reactionary. We still have not yet had the opportunity to grow to size like we want to, to be able to be proactive rather than reactive. And so we're getting there. And so you may have noticed too, the Tree City USA logo there at the bottom of the image. This is the city's 44th consecutive year as being tree, uh, certified as Tree City USA from J. Sterling Morgan's Arbor Day uh, National Arbor Day group. And uh, so this agency, this group goes also back 150 years. So what does it take to become Tree City USA? Well, you have to have a, a city forestry group or a, a, a like a parks advisory group. You can have a forestry advisory group. You have to have an ordinance. You have to have code. We've already saw that that was established in 1910. You have to spend $2 per capita on tree care. And then you have to have a proclamation that's signed by the mayor or a city entity that's high up, like in, uh, like last year we had um, Richard Scorman, Council President Scorman, sign our proclamation. And then you want to have a celebratory tree planting on a specific day. And this year, our Tree City USA uh, and Arbor Day will be celebrated next Friday at 10 a.m. at Soaring Eagles Park. And I encourage everyone, if you have time, to come out and watch that tree be planted. So next slide, please. And this is what we do. Uh, Jen kind of spoke in her introduction that uh, we have 300,000 street trees, about 50,000 park trees, and we have managed about a $500,000 contract between three different contractors for pruning and removals. We have a forest management side, which I manage. Uh, my background's in forest management. And uh, anytime that we have an insect or disease issue or fields mitigation project, um, 
or a forest health issue that we want to implement in our open spaces. Typically that occurs in the WUI on the, wild, on the wildland urban interface on the west side of town. And then we also maintain partnerships with city fire department and with the Colorado Springs utilities to manage forested properties that are mutually beneficial. And as I mentioned earlier, we have about 210 miles of right of way mowing, weed control, trash cleanup, and those kinds of things. Right now, you may see these guys if you're out and about after 11 o'clock till six in the morning. Uh, they have a night shift going on that'll last about three months. They're spraying the weeds on Academy and uh, I-15 and other high velocity corridors. So if you're out that late at night, uh, then be careful, watch for our guys. Next slide, please. Oh, I want to mention one other thing. Uh, we do have a mission statement. I'd like to read that to you. We manage our urban forest in a healthy, safe, and sustainable state that maintains our original forest legacy, manages risk, and increases the canopy coverage for shade, stormwater retention, and private property value. And it's estimated that the current value of just the city-owned trees is near $900 million. So that is a very large responsibility. That's a large number. It's uh, on the level with other infrastructure that the city owns. It's a responsibility that we take very uh, seriously and we work very hard to have a safe urban environment for the community that uses it. Next slide, please. So why go through all the trouble? What's the big deal? So actually urban forests uh, do have quite a few benefits for us as you can see in these images. Um, the big numbers are $100 million in air filtration. That's what our current urban forest, not just street trees, city owned trees, but the private trees as well. $97 million in stormwater uh, carbon sequestration and about 900,000 in stormwater retention. And of course, there's other things that we benefit too from our uh, urban canopy. Trees provide oxygen, they provide wildlife habitat. There are energy savings. If you have a large tree that's shading your house on a sunny day like today, uh, it saves energy. It's good for windbreaks and shade, uh, creates noise and sightline abatement, increased private property values. If you have a large tree like the ones that is in the Pioneers Museum on the bottom right, uh, that increases your property value by $10,000 per site, which is pretty cool improve traffic calming in residential neighborhoods and so on and so forth. And so it is a big deal. It is worth a lot of money. And so it's worthwhile to chase down these benefits and have a healthy, fully functioning ecosystem for our trees. And I think the greatest benefit of all to me is that trees can provide incalculable moments of serenity and beauty. And I think that's exemplified by the upper left hand image of the uh, redbud uh, in full spring bloom. And those are on its way as we speak. One nice warm days like today, where the trees are already starting to pop out, crab apples especially. Next slide, please. Two minute warning, Dennis. Two minutes. Okay, thank you. Almost done. So we do have a number of plans that we've created uh, that are available online for you to look at. I encourage you to do so if you're interested in the long-term plans for the city of Colorado Springs Urban Forest. Uh, next slide, please. This is what we're after. We have a um, quite a deficit in funding and personnel that was pointed out by the Urban Forest Management Plan. Uh, that was about a year in the making. And so we've spent quite a bit of time looking at the future of Colorado Springs to see what we might need. And so uh, these, this information is available in those plans from the previous slide. Next slide, please. And then and also, this also shows that the, we created four different scenarios for the city to find different ways to fund uh, city forestry operations. As you saw in the previous slide, we're about $7 million in the hole from what we think we actually need as uh, created by the International Society of Boriculture Standards. And so we have four different options for the city to choose from. Next slide, please. This is what 150 years worth of planting looks like. It's pretty, pretty cool. Quite the change. Next slide, please. The tree challenge is ongoing. 
We're about 4,000 trees into the tree challenge. We're trying to get our community to log in on our tree tracker, the trees that they plant and where they plant and the species. So if you're planting trees this spring or if you've already done it in the last year, you can go on to the Colorado Springs website and log your tree. It'd be interesting to see if we can get to that 18,071 trees that the mayor has challenged to the community for private and uh, public trees. This year, the city will be planting 400 trees in our parks, medians, and open spaces. Next slide. And of course, there's other challenges as well. Um, the city's trees take quite a beating. Vandals really uh, get after our trees. We have car wrecks, we have concrete issues, we have rot, uh, all kinds of things. So, so there are quite a bit of challenges to keep our trees alive and well and healthy and safe. Uh, this is just a short list. I, I shortened this list by half uh, just for brevity. Next slide, please. What's in the future? The thing that it's most my dear to my heart is biomass utilization. It just seems criminal to me that we cut down hardwood trees or street trees and grind them up and turn them into mulch. And so these three tables at the bottom of the slide are tables that I made from actual street trees that were milled uh, out in Black Forest. And uh, we're working towards getting a grant to try to fund uh, hiring crews and buying equipment to utilize some of this material. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, we're trying to get a street tree inventory done and code changes are still under review as a part of the urban forest management plan. Next slide, please. And this is a great, fantastic, hardworking group. Um, I, can't, I can't say enough about how proud I am to uh, be their boss and to be uh, encouraged by their hard work and their stamina to do things that are the impossible. And um, just very, very pleased to be the city forester. And I think I've got one more slide. If you need to get a hold of me, here's how you do it. And that's it. Thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Um, it's an awesome day. We're going to have some daylight left to get out and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Dennis, thank you so much. And I am very excited to say that UCCS is took you up on that challenge and we are planting 150 trees celebrating the 150th as part of that challenge. So thank you so much. And friends in the audience, thank you guys for asking some great questions. Uh, again, we will have some time for Q&A at the end and we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, and Dennis, maybe uh, when Dr. Bierman is speaking, maybe you can go into the chat and answer some of those questions or in Q&A. Sure. Uh, so now I would like to introduce our second presenter, Dr. Christine Bierman. She is an assistant professor of geography and environmental studies and director of the sustainability minor at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. She holds an undergraduate degree in geography from SUNY, an MS degree from the University of Tennessee and a PhD from Ohio State University. Her research on native and wild trout conservation is funded by the National Science Foundation. She also performs research on forest dynamics and directs the tree ring lab at UCCS. Christine currently teaches courses on environmental systems, climate and environmental change and forest ecology and dynamics. She is passionate about understanding environmental issues as also social issues and making science and academia more inclusive, diverse, and accessible. Dr. Bierman, over to you. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. So while Dennis painted us a picture of our city's forest history and our urban forest as a whole, I'm going to discuss a specific threat to our community's urban forest and the region's forested ecosystems more broadly. 
Our climate is changing, and here in Colorado Springs, we live at the ecotone or transition zone between lower montane forests and grassland or scrubland ecosystems. These transitional zones are believed to be particularly vulnerable to climatic and environmental changes. In light of this, I'm working with students at UCCS to better understand how our forest ecosystems of Colorado Springs are responding to severe and prolonged drought. The entire state of Colorado is currently experiencing conditions that are at least classified as abnormally dry, with much of the west slope of the Rockies currently experiencing extreme or exceptional drought. Here in El Paso County, as of this past week, we are experiencing conditions that range from moderate to severe drought. This is unfortunately not that anomalous for us. Global climate change is leading to longer, hotter, and more frequent droughts in Western North America. Many sites across the West are experiencing declining snowpack, earlier dates of snowmelt, and increasing temperatures. Even if precipitation were to remain stable, hotter temperatures increase evaporation and also increase plants' use of and demand for moisture. When we look at drought data for our region of Colorado, we can begin to identify some long-term trends in drought severity and frequency. This shows data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration on drought severity using an index called the Palmer Drought Severity Index. And this index accounts for both temperature and precipitation conditions that shape how severe a drought is. So on this graph, positive values are shown in green and they indicate above average moisture conditions. And those negative values in yellow indicate below average moisture conditions. So drought is defined as a protracted period of below average moisture conditions. And we can see when we look at this graph, we can see in the 1930s, the signature of the Dust Bowl. And then we can see alternating periods of drought and non-drought throughout much of the second half of the 20th century. But what I want to call your attention to are the past 20 or so years of this data on the far right part of your screen. And notice that we have experienced the two most severe droughts in this recorded history since 1895, just in the past two decades. And something that distinguishes these droughts from earlier droughts are the higher temperatures at play, particularly during the spring and summer months. So these are hotter droughts and hotter droughts are more severe generally. These droughts not surprisingly correspond with wildfire activity in 2002 during the second most severe drought in this um, 125 year period. Uh, we experienced the Hayman fire and then in 2012 and 2013 during the most severe drought in this time period, um, the Waldo Canyon and Black Forest fires occurred. Also note this blue line running downward across the screen. And this shows the overall trend over time from 1895 through 2021. So we're seeing this long-term trend toward drought conditions. This trend toward increasingly hot, frequent, and severe drought has big ramifications for forests of the arid and semi-arid West. In many sites across the region, widespread forest mortality has been documented since about the year 2000s due to what has been called the triple threat of drought, fire, and insect outbreaks. These disturbances don't operate in isolation, they act in association with one another, and drought can increase the risk of wildfire and can also make trees more susceptible to insect outbreaks and other pathogens. And one example of widespread drought-induced forest mortality is pictured here outside of Los Alamos, New Mexico. Um, and it's a site that has been studied by forest scientist Craig Allen. And in 2002, on the left, we see um, pinion pines that have reddish brown foliage in October 2002. Remember 2002 was that second most severe drought on the graph on the previous slide. And by two years later, November 2004, after a long period of drought conditions, massive forest die-off had occurred. And the, that normal, that reddish brown foliage that you can see from the struggling pinion pines on your left 
has been replaced as the pinions have completely died, lost all of their needles, their bark has been exposed. And this exemplifies how many trees succumb to drought. It is often not an acute process, but a long-term process of carbon starvation. Where trees shut down growth, they close their stomata, the little pores or openings on their needles or leaves that allow them to exchange gas and water. So they close these to preserve water and they shut down growth during a drought. When trees like pinion pines, which are common here in Colorado Springs, experience long-term water stress that lasts 10 or more months, they often will die or experience a beetle infestation that hastens mortality. So when severe drought conditions are shorter and last you know, three to eight months, pinion pines are generally able to recover from drought. Now, different species have different tolerances for drought. And here in Colorado Springs, in our parks and open spaces, we have a few key vegetation communities uh, named for their dominant tree species. So first on the left, we have pinion juniper woodlands. Um, and an example of this would be in the area around Garden of the Gods or Red Rock Canyon, or as you're driving Highway 24 um, past Manitou Springs. And the, these forests are dominated by pinion pine as well as one seed juniper and um, sometimes Rocky Mountain juniper. And these tend to be the most drought tolerant of the three forested ecosystems pictured here. We often see pinion juniper woodlands at the lower elevation forest edge and on fairly dry south or southwest facing slopes. Next, on your bottom right, probably the most common native tree in our open space here in Colorado Springs is the ponderosa pine, um, pictured here in Austin Bluffs open space. This is also a fairly drought tolerant species. And then finally, we have Douglas fir forests, which can be found in our moister forest sites at slightly higher elevations and often on less exposed north facing or east facing slopes. Now to understand how these different trees are responding to the series of out since 2000s, we have been using a technique called dendrochronology to study the annual growth rings of trees growing um, in and around the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. So up on the bluffs above the UCCS campus. And we have all three of these species, or um, all, excuse me, all four of the species talked about in the previous slide found on UCCS property, Douglas firs at those higher elevations ponderosa pine, pinion pine, and one seed juniper. So as trees grow, they record information about the conditions around them in their annual growth rings. In the early growing season, if moisture is plentiful, trees put on large cells that form the early wood of an annual growth ring. As the growing season comes to a close, growth slows, the cells get smaller, and they form this band of darker wood called late wood. So by analyzing patterns of wide and narrow rings over time, we can determine how trees respond to changing climatic and environmental conditions. A narrow ring, for example, might indicate a drier than average year, while a wider ring signifies often a year when moisture was abundant. So we're, we are collecting core samples from living trees using an, the instrument pictured here called an increment borer. And this is a non-destructive technique that allows us to get a small sample from a living tree about the size of a straw. And we collect those core samples um, and we have collected them from various sites in and around the bluffs above the main uh, campus of UCCS and toward the Heller Center area as well. So after collecting the core samples, we mount them, basically glue them into these wooden core mounts, sand the samples so that we can see the individual ring boundaries, and then scan those samples and measure their ring widths using digital measuring software. And so this is um, an image of three three of the species we are studying, Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, and pinion pine. So let's zoom in and look at 
one specific Douglas fir core that was collected from the bluffs above UCCS and was dated um, to 1636. So the earliest year of growth that we identified was 1636. So a very long lived old tree for our region. And this is, um, this is a high resolution image of the most recent years of growth. So on the right, you see the bark, the brown part is the bark. And then your move as you move toward the left, we see we're going back in time. So toward the right is the most recent years of growth. So what I want to point out to you are the ways in which these growth rings and their widths correspond to that Palmer drought severity index uh, data that we looked at earlier. So you can see this very narrow ring on the far right where I've labeled 2018 corresponds with a period of drought um, that was particularly strong during the early growing season of 2018. Then as we go back in time, um, we see a very wide ring with a thick band of late wood in 2015. And this corresponds with abundant moisture conditions in 2015. Going back further, we see a very narrow ring in 2013 um, that corresponds with the 2011 through 2013 drought. And actually this tree is entirely missing its 2011 ring. It never began to put on radial growth during this period of drought. Going back further, we see 2007, a fairly wide ring again that corresponds with a period of abundant moisture conditions. Going back a little bit further, we've got a very narrow ring just the year before in 2006 during a period of drought. 2002, like that 2011 year, the tree simply never began to put on a ring. And this was again during that period of severe drought um, that began in late uh, 2001. So during drought years, trees tend to put on those narrow growth rings or as seen here, they may not put on a ring at all. So in this study, I wanna highlight a few of the things we have found so far by looking at these different species and trying to understand their responses to climate. A few of our big findings are first, some of these trees that we have seen are a lot older than we were expecting. Um, we have identified some trees that date back to the early 1600s. And so one takeaway from this is trees growing on undeveloped bluffs in Colorado Springs may be older than you think. For all the species that we are studying, spring conditions, particularly conditions April through June, so that early growing season, appear to have the strongest impact on tree growth. So what's going on in spring tends to um, matter most for the tree. Even if moisture becomes more abundant later in the growing season, July, August, usually um, that's not quite enough for a tree to um, experience a good growing season in terms of radial growth. So spring conditions are super important for our trees. Also, one interesting finding when we compare the climate responses to these recent droughts across the different species, we are seeing slightly different um, responses to those droughts. One interesting preliminary finding is that Douglas firs tended to experience dramatic growth declines during and following these severe droughts, but they appear to rebound a bit more quickly than either pinyon pine or ponderosa pine. And one of the takeaways from this is that drought resistance varies and is different from drought resilience. So we can think about a tree's drought resistance or the forest drought resistance as its ability to withstand and do okay during a drought, whereas resilience is that ability to bounce back following a drought. So certain species may um, be more drought resistant, but a little less resilient in the long run or vice versa. And then finally, tree age and the density of a forest stand affect the drought response of individual trees. 
So one thing we found is that um, for many of our trees that were growing in more dense stands with more competitors around them, those trees tended to be a little bit more sensitive to drought, a little bit more vulnerable to drought. Their growth was reduced a little bit more than trees that were growing um, in a slightly less dense or less competitive environment. Also, their trees' response to drought varies by age. So younger trees, thus far in our preliminary results, younger trees appear to be more sensitive to drought and reduce their growth more significantly than older trees. One of the big takeaways then also is that these impacts of drought on our forests and on individual trees are long lasting. Even when a drought ends, that stressor is not over for an individual tree or for the forest as a whole. And we see long-term effects that shape tree growth even following a drought. And these are often referred to as legacy effects. Drought leaves an ecological legacy um, in our, on our landscapes and in the way trees grow even after a drought ends. So can we manage our forests to be more drought resilient? We know that climate is changing. We know that droughts here in this region tend to be severe and appear to be getting more severe and potentially more frequent. So what can we do? And what do these findings um, from our study coupled with findings from other studies about drought impacts on forests, what can they teach us about how forests can be managed? One of the first things is that thinning and prescribed burns not only are tools to reduce the risk of wildfire for forests, but can also reduce forest vulnerability to climate and drought. And we know this in part because of when we think about that um, competitive, the um, stand density and the competitive uh, environments that trees are growing in, when they're growing in less competitive environments, we tend to see a little bit um, less vulnerability to drought. So it may be that these management tools are not only tools for wildfire risk, but can also help improve a forest resilience to drought and help reduce mortality rates during and after those severe droughts. Second, Promoting diversity in terms of age classes within our forests, the age of the tree, and species diversity may increase resilience. We know from comparing the um, drought resistance and resilience of different species that each species is a little bit different in how it responds to drought. We also know, as I mentioned before, that the age of a tree impacts the way it responds to drought. So promoting forests that are diverse in terms of the ages of trees and the species present may help increase resilience to future droughts and reduce mortality rates. Third, restoration and tree planting projects need to plan for a drier, hotter future. And this goes back to Dennis's point about the need for proactive management. Given these projections for future climatic changes and existing already occurring changes, um, we really need proactive management in order to make sure that um, our forests are going to be resilient, as resilient to drought as possible. And then finally, north facing slopes and higher elevations may be more drought resistant. And so it's incredibly important to keep these in habitats intact in management. All right, that's all. I just wanna say a thank you also to all of the UCCS students who have been involved in this project, um, as well as the UCCS Green Action Fund for providing funding for us to do this stuff. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. Uh, at this point in time, we are going to do some Q&A. You guys have some incredible questions, uh, but I will tell you that we are probably not going to be able to get to all of them, uh, but we are going to try and tackle a couple of them. So first one, Dennis, this is going to go to you. And Christine, maybe in the 
Q&A box, maybe you can grab that and answer some of those questions as well so that maybe we can try and get to as many as we can. Uh, Dennis, first question is for you. I know, you know, back in the day, the main tree was cottonwoods. What is the main species of trees planted by the city right now? We're starting to lean towards oaks. We used to plant a lot of ash, but ash is under threat from another invasive species. So we have about eight different species of oaks that we really liked it, that seem to perform well in Colorado, Colorado Springs. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christine, this one is for you. Uh, in the interest of forest resilience and anticipating climate change, should we more actively manage for native trees in our urban forest areas? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, um, you know, thus far, I think the answer is yes, though, of course, it's a question of resources also. And oftentimes, as Dennis alluded to, um, without resources for proactive management, a lot of times the management is reactive. And, you know, so I think, I think um, promoting and working to obtain the resources for that proactive management is a big important part of um, active management of our, of our native forests. Okay, thank you. Dennis, next one is for you. How does the Colorado Springs Forestry Department interface with the folks that manage Pikes Peak National Forest and Cheyenne Mountain State Park, if any? Uh, that's another good question. Uh, we work as much as we can with the US Forest Service. There's not a lot of property that adjoins each other's property. Uh, the only place that really does that is in like in Blodgett open space uh, where those properties actually touch. Also the fuels mitigation work that we might want to do um, in the US Forest Service property cross boundary is fairly small, like in Blodgett. So we don't really do a lot in, the, in those kinds of terms, uh, but we are on uh, a good speaking partnership with them. We know what they're doing in their backyard and same for us. So um, we work with them pretty well. Good, thank you. Uh, Christine, this one is for you. Have you done any tree ring analysis of street trees in Colorado Springs to assess how well they are faring? And does the irrigation in yards buffer urban trees from drought trees? Oh, you're on mute, my dear. Yeah, I have not done tree ring analysis of street trees, um, but Irrigation and living in yards certainly should buffer urban trees from drought stress. Uh, though, of course, it's important during those periods of drought that the tree is uh, receiving abundant water or enough water. Um, so yeah, street trees are impacted by drought, though the impacts tend to be buffered. Yeah. Um, Dennis, this is over to you in regards to weed control, chemicals, our little pollinators and our bees, how, how are you managing weed control with pollinators and sustainability and environment? So the only place we spray herbicides is along the right-of-ways for control of weeds or like in the medians and those concrete medians. And we do that early in the winter and late winter. And we do that with a chemical called prodiamine, which is a uh, chemical that you lay down before the weeds sprout up. And so then when they do, they encounter uh, that chemical in their environment. So we're not spraying any time at all during the time that the bees are active later in the spring. Okay, thank you. Christine, back to you. Uh, impacts of air quality, um, especially growing ozone, how is that affecting our trees? Um, that's a good question and something I haven't specifically researched, um, but certainly air quality and pollutants in the air can impact um, tree growth. And oftentimes you can, if you do chemical analysis of the tree rings, you can see those pollutants actually in the wood itself. And one thing we, I haven't studied here in Colorado Springs, but certainly happens is that 
um, pollutants in the air when taken up by a tree change the way trees respond to climate. So they could theoretically make trees more or less sensitive to climatic changes. Okay, excellent. Uh, we're gonna do one question, one more question for each of you and I apologize. I know there are so many good questions. Um, next one, Dennis, this is for you. Elm seedlings, they grow so quickly, um, broken branches, things like that. How's the city dealing with that? And what advice do you have for everybody else? I would say that Siberian elms are the worst woody vegetation invasive organism we have in the city. And as time goes on, it gets harder to control and it becomes worse, especially in our riparian areas where though that particular species is outstripping the growth rate of our native willows and cottonwoods and then replacing them. And so it's a, it's a very serious problem that um, I have been kind of raising the alarm for about the last four or five years and hoping to get more partnerships with other uh, city entities like public works, especially where in those riparian areas. So they're difficult to get rid of. So if you cut the tree down, it wants to sprout back. And so you have to spray a herbicide on that stump. Or if you do it in the spring, you get the tree down, let it sprout and create new leaves and spray those new leaves. That way it exhausts the stored reserves in the root system and kills the new growth. And you may have to do that several times. Uh, it's a fairly benign chemical. You can, if it's along the right of ways, you can get the aquatic versions. Um, the chemical is not harmful to anything other than woody vegetation. But you have to be persistent. Thank you. Uh, Christine, this last one is for you. Are the 400 year old trees a certain type of tree? Yes, good question. Um, so the Douglas firs, um, there are several roughly 400 year old Douglas firs growing on the bluffs above UCCS. And then there are a few pinion pine also that date back to the 1600s. Um, no ponderosa pines that have been dated back that far. No. Excellent. So thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Christine, uh, and attendees for your participation this afternoon. Uh, please join UCCS for the fourth and final lecture in this series on Tuesday, May 25th. Uh, it's going to be a virtual event exploring Colorado Springs past, present, and future of health and wellness. Um, registration will be coming soon. Keep your eyes peeled for an invitation. Uh, you can visit uccs.edu slash 150th for more information. Thank you all so much. I would encourage you. There were so many questions that we did not get to. Reach out to Dennis. Reach out to Christine. Uh, I'm sure that they would love to answer those questions. Have a great sunny afternoon and go hug a tree. Thank you, everybody.